right, so um, today we're starting a brand new series, and um, it's on, I mean, something we all need, relationships. Now, let me say, it's tempting for me to go in a lot of different directions on a relationship series. I could talk about types of relationships, like marriage, friends, coworkers. Um, I could also talk about the theology of relationships, you know, the idea that God created us for relationships. But let's just be honest, if I'm gonna spend time on relationships, what you want is help with the ones that are bringing you the most frustration. I mean, at the end of the day, you don't care that the Greek word for community is koinonia if you wanna strangle people. You want help. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, you know, by, by the uh, kind of just the nature of my position, I have sat with hundreds of people over the years. And I've heard them pour out their pain and agony in a dysfunctional relationship and uh, unique situations, unique moments, unique details. But here's what many of them summarize. They just go, it's just complicated. Meaning they're just confused. They don't know what to do. And they start to believe that they have a problem that no one else has had, that has had and can be fixed. And so over the years, though you have different details in your relationships, here's what I've noticed. Most of our dysfunctions come back to four categories, four things that I see overwhelmingly that if you can address them and correct them, those four things um, will allow you to have strong relationships. So I've dipped into scripture and my counseling background, and I have, for the next few weeks, I'm going to cover these four things. And here's what I believe, that if you will kind of lean in and really take the tone of this, not as a sermon, but as a session, like, like, if we could sit down in my office, these are the steps I would give you. And, um, and, and if you can apply these, you can just about make any relationship work. You can fix just about any relationship. So if you've ever wanted to sit down and, and have a conversation about your dysfunctional relationships, this is the series for you. And I want you to be here every week for it. And that means today I want you to grab something to take notes um, because we're going to start off with this, um, how to resolve conflict. How to resolve conflict. Uh, I read a story about an airline employee that was helping an enraged customer at their desk. The customer was, I mean, just belligerent. They were insulting. Uh, they were complaining about the policies, impatient. And, um, and this airline employee, I mean, they just kept a smile. They were kind, gentle. Um, and no matter how uh, much the uh, passenger cursed them, they just kept showing kind of just a, a good nature about them. Well, eventually, the, they, they answered all the questions, and the passenger walks off in rage towards his gate. Well, the next lady in line comes up. She's a sweet little lady. She leans up and says, excuse me. She said, I, I just want to tell you, the fact that you kept your composure and you were so kind, I'm just so impressed. How, how did you do that? How were you so controlled? Well, the airline uh, employee just said, oh, you know what I did? I just, I just kept thinking. He's going to Chicago, but now his bags are going to Nicaragua, and they helped get me through. L listen, conflict's just a fact of life, right? I mean, it just if you put two people in a room, they both want their way. That's, in, that's true in marriage. It's true in parenting. It's true in work. It's true in teams. It's, it's true in churches. The question is not, are you going to have conflict? The question is, do you know how to handle it? And, um, and, and the truth is that for most of us, we don't. We didn't go to school and gain the right skills for it. We, our parents didn't necessarily teach it to us. And what we've been left with is kind of this trial and error process on how to handle conflict. And for many of us, we, it's been pretty painful. You know, our default when it comes to conflict is usually one of two things. You're either going to blame the other person or avoid the subject altogether. By blame, I mean that you spend most of your energy not trying to resolve it, but trying to uh, put the blame on them for it. Like you're, you're a mental prosecutor building a case at all the things they've said and done. And, and here's the problem with blame. Blame just never makes anything better. It's like handing someone else the key to your happiness. It's like saying, hey, unless you do this, I can't be happy. And the reality of that is you're going to be miserable your entire life doing that. Whereas avoidance is not much better. Avoidance is when we just sweep it under a rug, we act like it didn't happen, we just stuff it down. The problem with avoidance is this, is that out of sight, out of mind doesn't mean out of heart. That something that you want to just ignore still resides in you. And eventually you decide to just handle it, but usually just on the surface. You change jobs, change friends, change churches. But just because you change or avoid the situation doesn't mean you're going to resolve it. As a matter of fact, avoidance is often just the decision to be miserable somewhere else. You see, our hearts 
are the ones that, that ultimately betray us in conflict. And what I mean by that is that our hearts are like containers. And when you're in a conflict, anger begins to build up in that container. Now, for some of you, that may be just a quiet stewing, and for some of you, it's a passionate spewing, but your heart, it, it hurt doesn't just evaporate, it, it, it accumulates. And it brings you to the point of, of, of the word offense, that someone else has offended you. Now, let me say that there's nothing wrong with offense. As a matter of fact, Jesus said this, he said, offenses will come, like it's an inevitable part of life. But the way I want you to think of offense today is this, not as something that you should avoid, but as a crossroads you stand at. That offense gives you only two options. The first one is this, that you can carry it or you can confront it. Carry it means that you just choose to, to never talk about it, never, never uh, address it, never resolve it. You're just going to stuff it down, stuff it down, stuff it down. Whereas confronting means that you're going to go to that person and say, hey, hey, we need to have a conversation. We need to talk about this issue. We need to talk about what happened between us. One of uh, Confronting includes the person you're offended at. Caring chooses to just carry the weight of it yourself. Now, when you do that, both of these lead to the next kind of phase, which is discomfort, but different types of discomfort. You see, the, the discomfort that comes from carrying it ultimately leads to this idea that you're going to end up in resentment. And, and resentment is very uncomfortable. It eats away at the inside of us. It, it, it preoccupies our minds. It, it causes us to, to spend sometimes years with an unforgiveness or resentment towards another person. Confronting also has a discomfort, but it's short-lived. It's the idea that it's uncomfortable to have a conversation with you. It's uncomfortable to bring this issue up. It's uncomfortable for us to put our, our, our concerns on the table, but it leads to resolution. When you choose to, to, to carry it, you're going to be uncomfortable for a long time and end up in resentment. When you choose to confront it, it's not going to be fun, but you're going to end up at a place of peace. And ultimately, that's what we're looking at. Your decisions on conflict are either going to li either introduce a lifetime of pain or peace. And, and now, here's the reality. You don't get to choose if you're offended. You only get to choose where it takes you. And where it takes you is usually informed by who is informing the way you see conflict. Let me say it this way. Your choices are supported by the voices that are leading you through conflict. And Scripture is very clear. There are two voices that are ultimately guiding us. One of them is the voice of the Lord Jesus. And in 2 um, Corinthians chapter 5, we're told that he came to help us make peace. That he always leads us in a path that will find resolution. Whereas there's another voice. And it's your spiritual enemy. And his goal is to never let you find peace, but to always make sure you end up in pain. And how you handle conflict determines how you've empowered him. I'll show it to you. Ephesians chapter 4 says, be angry without sinning. I, I love the Bible because it's honest enough to go, hey, you're going to be angry. Just control it. How, how, how do we control it? Well, don't go to bed angry. It's acknowledging that anger is fine, but it needs to have an expiration date because when it's held over is when it starts to bring damage. What kind of damage? Well, it gives the devil an opportunity to work. Now, I, I, the word devil there is the word diablos in Greek, and it means slanderer. And I was captured by this phrase, opportunity to work. When you and I keep anger from offenses over a long period of time, we have handed the enemy an opportunity to work. Let me say it this way. We've hired him as our advisor on this relationship. And he specializes in slander, which is why as our advisor, he starts to put divisive thoughts in our minds. He starts to attack the character of our spouse, our kids, our coworkers. It's why he, he tells us, don't, you're a victim, don't resolve this, you deserve better. He feeds the worst in us, ultimately hoping to keep us in pain. He, we've literally hired him to counsel us through these relationships, and he's always going to bring us to a place of pain. Now, this is not just theory. I, I, I'm saying I've lived this, you've lived this. Kayla and I got married very young, and, um, and, and I would say that we had a very undeveloped understanding of conflict. It's been a, something that we've had to work on for years. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, there have been different seasons. I remember one in particular where we had prolonged conflict over days. And we started off, you know, passionate and loud, and we just ground to silent and stubborn. 
And I remember uh, one particular night somewhere in there, we had went multiple nights going to bed angry. And, and there, you, know, you know how that is. I mean, you, you go in there and you sleep as close to the edge as you can. You don't even want to get close to the other person. Your back's against them and, and you don't even look their way. I mean, you don't even breathe loud because you want them to wonder if you've died. Like that's just, you know, and, and you act like you're asleep, but you're not. And I remember laying there acting like I was asleep, and, and, and I don't remember what night it was, but I do remember all of a sudden there was a thought emerged, and here was the thought. This is always going to be this way. She's never going to respect you. You've made a mistake. And I remember that thought swirling and swirling until the next morning I got up, and it was just pure torment. It's always going to be this way. She's never going to see me as uh, her husband and honor me, and, and, and listen... I have made a mistake. And I remember living with that for a few days until finally the torment, because you, you know what it's like, you're just tormented, like your, your, your heart's heavy, your, your mind's racing. And I remember just desperately going to the scripture and saying, God, you gotta speak to me. Turns out that day my Bible reading plan was Ephesians chapter four. And when I read the verse I just read to you, here's what I heard the Holy Spirit say, you have hired the devil as your marriage counselor. And he's gonna destroy this if you don't get a hold of what's going on. And um, it, it just kind of, it sobered me up. And what I, what I mean by that is all of a sudden, I didn't see this conflict through the lens of my feelings and my way. I saw it through the lens of scripture. And I saw Kayla, I, 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 how I'd hurt her. I saw what I needed to forgive. I, I saw the gift that she is to me from God. And I sent her a text and said, hey, we got to talk. And, and we came together and we respectfully, kindly, we worked through some of those issues and brought resolution. But I just remember that sobering going, the devil is my marriage counselor. Let me ask you this, who's counseling your conflict? Like some of you are getting career advice from Satan himself. Some of you are getting marriage advice from your spiritual enemy. Some of you are getting parenting advice from, from the person who never wants you to be at peace at all. Listen, you have to understand the goal of your spiritual enemy is that you would keep anger your entire life because it, it just drains you of strength and it destroys every relationship you have, including your relationship with God. How you handle conflict is no small thing. It is a life or death issue. And it's because it doesn't just inform you, it informs those around you. Your life is informed by it. For example, your kids are learning how to handle conflict from you. And you're either teaching them to resent people or resolve things. And you, your job, listen, your boss isn't going to promote you if you can't get along with the people around you. Your faith, your, how you handle conflict is either the difference of are you being led by the Holy Spirit or hell? You have to get control of conflict or it will cost you the abundant life. And now here's the good news. You don't have to be a relationship expert or win a Nobel Peace Prize to win in relationships, though. All you have to do is make sure the person counseling you is the Lord Jesus and not your spiritual enemy. And what I love about scripture is Jesus doesn't just come with a bunch of lofty ideas. He comes with some practical help and speaks directly to how to handle conflict. Matthew chapter 18, these are the words of Jesus. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. These 27 words, if practiced, can prosper nearly any relationship. If you can take these 27 words and pull the principles out of them that Jesus highlights, you can, you can please God and just about restore any relationship that you have. And so I, I, I'm going to help you pull out. There are five things. And, and let me just say, you may be here in conflict today. Um, you should write these five things down, even if you're not, though. And, and, and husband and wife, write them down. Valentine's Day is just in a few days. You need these. If we're going to have a good Wednesday, we got to have these on Sunday, Okay. So I want you to write these down because um, how you handle conflict is, is it's everything on if you inherit all God has for you. Here, here's the first one. According to Jesus, we start by asking God for help. First thing he says is, if you are another believer, notice the context. It's this idea that he's approaching this from the standpoint of you're a believer. So he, he's saying your mindset on this is not what your parents have said what you learned in a YouTube video, what you think or your emotions are informing you, I'm assuming you're coming to this as a believer, meaning you're under my lordship. And, and that's essential because for most of us, conflict is actually, it's, it, the leadership of our conflict is our emotions. And he's saying the very first place we start is saying, no, God, you're the leadership of this. 
And that's important because when, for most of us, we don't start by going to God when it comes to conflict. We go to everybody else, trying to get them on our side. Go to your coworkers, tell them how bad your boss is. Go to your, you know, your, your, your friends, tell them how bad your spouse is. And, and what we're doing is going to everybody else for their insights while ignoring God. Listen, if you go to other people for their insights, that's called gossip. You go to God, it's called prayer. And you're going to get a big difference there because God can tell you and give you things in this relationship no one else can. Um, for example, when you show up before, com- before even going to the other person be- that you're offended at or someone else, you show up to God, he's going to deposit two things in you. And the first one's this, he's going to give you his wisdom. We need God's wisdom. And just think about it. He's the only person that knows you and knows them because he created you and created them and can see your heart and their heart all at the same time. Oftentimes, the person that we're in conflict with cannot even verbalize their true needs. So even they can't tell you what they need, but God can. He can give you insight into what that person needs, how to approach them, how to resolve things. He is able to give us insights no one else on the planet can, so we need that. But he also gives us his love. We, we, in our culture, we think love is kind of powered by how we feel. That's not true at all. For, um, 1 John 4, 7 says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Do you know what that means? It means the most important decision you make every day when it comes to relationships is, who's going to power what this relationship needs? Me or the Holy Spirit? If it's you, then you're the one that has to come up with all the mercy, all the grace, all the love, all the kindness, all the patience. You've got to make that happen. But if you're saying, no, the Holy Spirit is the one who powers my relationships, then we get all his grace, all his mercy, all his kindness, all his patience. And and here's the thing, yours is limited, his is completely unlimited. He can give you all the patience needed for your kids. He can give you all the mercy needed for your boss because he has an unlimited supply of it. You see, um, that's why it is essential that you have the rhythm of showing up every day and spending time with God in the beginning of your day, opening his word, taking in his scriptures, praying, because in those moments when you're regularly showing up, he's refilling your emotional cup for the people who will drain you of it. And as I was praying over this, here's what I really think. I don't think some of you are angry. I think many of you are empty. The issue's not that the conflict's so bad. It's that you're showing up empty. No grace, no mercy, no kindness, no patience, because you have given no time to letting God fill you up. I think for some of you, you just start letting God fill you up, this this fight will cool down. Because you're either going to have to power this relationship, or God's going to. Here's the second one. Um, Take initiative. Now, we want to be first in everything. Fantasy football, out of the church parking lot. First at the table at dinner. I mean, we won't be first at everything except for conflict resolution. Chances are, if you're here today and you have an active conflict with someone, you're waiting on them to do something. Waiting on them to say they're sorry. Waiting on them to come and admit what they did. Waiting on them to text you, to express something to you. You're waiting. That's not what Jesus instructs us to do. He says, go. Go. Don't wait. Don't consider. Don't process. Don't stew. Don't stonewall. Go. Go. Be proactive, be intentional, pursue them. And here's what he's saying. Conflict resolution seldom happens accidentally. It's not something you're just going to stumble into. Someone in this relationship has to stand up and go, we're going to take care of this. And he's instructing you and I as the believer to do it. Now, um, with that being said, what we have to recognize is this, is that we need a motivation for that. Because when our, our, our feelings are so frustrated or hurt, we don't, we don't want to go. So the way that I need you to look at conflict that's unresolved is like this, like cancer. Now, cancer, by definition, is when some cells that were once in unity have now turned and become destructive. Your body has almost 30 30 trillion cells in it, and it only takes a few to go rogue to destroy your entire body. And here's what I know about you, that if, if you got a diagnosis of cancer, you wouldn't say, well, I'll get to that in a few weeks. I'll wait on the doctor to call me. I'll, I'll, if, if treatment wants me, then treatment can find me. <laughs> you know why? Because you go, this is cancer. I'm going to do whatever it takes as quick as I can to deal with this. That's what unresolved conflict is to your soul. 
It's heavy on your heart. It burns in your chest. It races in your mind. It causes distance between you and other people and you and God. It is destructive. That's why scripture says you can keep it for a day, but after that, you've got to get rid of it. It's cancer. And that's the motivation I need you to have. When it says go and you don't want to, think of it. I'm keeping cancer. So therefore, even today, I need you to quickly assess when's the best time for you guys to get together. Now, the right time is when you're at your best. Listen, uh, mom and dad, if the best time to talk about conflict is not 11 p.m. after you just got the kids in bed, pick the time you're at the best and send an invitation for them to join you for that conversation. I mean, today, that's going to be the altar call for many of you. You need to walk out, pick up your phone and say, hey, we need to talk tomorrow. Now, let me warn you, between me saying that and you getting to the back of this room, fear will come and offer to be your counselor. It'll come and say, if you do this, you're going to be rejected again. If you, if you take this step, you're going to show them you're weak. If you do this, you're going, to, you're going to be a doormat in this relationship for the rest of your life. And all I want to remind you of is that God never leads through fear. And he never blesses a fear-based decision. It takes courage to resolve conflict. And what you and I need to remember is that many relationships die not because of a conversation that was had, but because a conversation wasn't had. And so you, you just need to decide that I've not been given a spirit of fear but of power, love, and a sound mind, which is essential to resolve conflict, and I'm going to quickly go and take care of this. Now, now you're going to need that, that bravery for one more thing. The minute the conversation starts, the very first thing I want you to do is confess your part in it. Now, um, that's, that's tough. I, I, no, 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 no. Getting to the table is hard enough. You want me to own up to the part I've done? Well, not so much me, but Jesus. Matthew 7 how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you call, uh, can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first, get rid of the log in your own eye. Now, and I know, listen, I know I can hear you. I've sat with enough people here, but you don't understand. They've done 99% of the, the things they've said, the things they've done, the way they've acted. 99% of this is their problem. Okay, okay, okay. 99% is them. I need you to confess the 1%. And here's why. It's not about, it, it, it really isn't, it's not about the percentages. It's about the idea you are signaling to God humility. Humility is an extinguisher to the raging fires of conflict. People show up ready to fight, and when someone displays humility, it quells the, the rage that's in them. The Bible says God gives grace to the humble, that supernatural favor. The Bible says that humility silences the voice of the enemy through pride. And humility shows the other person, you're here for resolution, not to fight. And so if it's just 1%, I need you to be brave enough to start the conversation, but also to confess first in the conversation. Now, here's the next one. Um, right after that, I want you to listen, listen attentively. You know why people raise their voice in, in conflict? They don't feel heard. They don't feel understood. So they feel like they got to get louder. And, and, and that's why Jesus' brother James writes in his epistle, he says when it comes to anger and conflict, he says, be slow to speak and quick to listen. Because people who listen are able to disarm conflict. Um, listening is so much more important, though, than just like, there's gathering information. It's communicating other things. Um, you know, I travel quite a bit, and so I stay in a lot of hotels, and every once in a while, um, I'll have to go to the front desk and kind of say, hey, something in my room's not right. I remember one time we were in Tampa, got in late, went in, and the bathroom was disgusting. I'm talking about it didn't look like it had been cleaned at all. There was, I won't get into all the details. Stuff on the wall, nasty, okay? So I went down to the front desk, and I, I just said, hey, I said, um, I, I know, you know you, you didn't cause this, but there's, um, there's some stuff in the bathroom, and I outlined it all. And this, this clerk looked at me and said, well, how do I know you're telling the truth? <laughs> he said, I'm going to need pictures to send a cleaning crew up there. I said, you want me to go back upstairs, take pictures of this mess, and you want to bring it back down, and that's the only way you, yeah. And I, I, so, you know, I'm, 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 I, I just said, I'm not here to get a free vacation. I just need some Clorox. Like, that's all we're, you know, no, 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 I can't do it without pictures. So I went upstairs, took pictures, came back down, showed them the pictures. And then even then, reluctant, like, like well, that didn't look that bad. Just, just obstinate. And so I, finally, they sent a cleaning crew. And I, you know, I'm frustrated because I don't feel hurt. I don't feel, it's, so you know, I had to take my issues to Jesus and Yelp, you know, uh, for the, <laughs> 
But here's what I'm saying. Listening is important because it communicates, I believe you. I believe you. And, and if people don't feel, if people show up to you in conflict and they always feel like they're guilty until proven innocent, they're not going to open up. And if they don't open up, there can't be any restoration. If there can't be any restoration, the relationship's dead. We're just waiting for the clock to run out. Listening communicates, I value you more than what we're fighting about. It communicates, I am a trustworthy place with where you can come and share your offenses and we can work through them. But if you're incredibly defensive, if you are a person that can't listen to someone else or you refute everything they said, I mean, and this is something that, that Kayla and I have had to learn, but until you can listen, you are not going to find partners for resolution. That's the reason it's called, by the way, listening is called paying attention. You are paying something. It costs you your agenda, your views, your assumptions. You are paying to show the other person you value them. Okay. Now, here's the next one. Um, be clear and kind. You know, the emotions get in it, and when we get into conflict and we're finally ready to share our point, often our emotions undo the work we've done up to this point. And what I mean by that is that we get in there and we start attacking the person and not the problem. And so therefore, it is essential that you show up with the determination to control your tone and to communicate clearly, okay? Because you're never going to get anywhere insulting them. You've got to stay focused on the issues. So one of the things that I really want to encourage you is to show up prepared with your thoughts. Never show up to conflict just, well, I'll just wing it. I'll just, I'll just you hear people say, I'm just going to share my heart. No, don't do that. No, no, no. I need you to show up with the specific things you're frustrated about. And I even need you to phrase them to where they're not um, accusations, they're descriptions of how you feel. See, a lot of times we show up and you're this way and you're this way and you're the. No, no, no. When you use that tone, it makes me feel threatened. When you, when you say that word, it triggers something from me from the past. What I'm doing is describing what's going on in me, not accusing you. Because a lot of times when we show up in conflict, we're so emotional and attacking to the other person that halfway through it, they go, well, the problem is me. When the problem's really an issue, but they think the problem's them. And they go, well, I can't change me, so that we, we can't have this. And that's not true. That's what the Bible means when it says in Ephesians, speaking the truth in love. You, did you know you can speak the truth and it's, it weapon, it's like a weapon? Truth is not enough in order to restore a relationship. It's truth in love. See, the, the, the truth without love is resisted. Truth with love is received. And what we have to recognize is the tone and, and the descriptions we use are incredibly, even when we're telling the truth, incredible. I've just never had anybody come to me and say, you know, Pastor Joe, what really turned around our marriage is when he started cursing me. I mean, when he would cuss me good, it just, man, I could become the wife that he wanted me to become. And, and here's why. You can never, you, you have to show up with an, an opposite spirit to what you're dealing with. If the spirit you're dealing with is strife and contention, how is it going to get better with you escalating that? Instead, you've got to show up in peace and love and encouragement. Listen, you're never going to get what you want out of your kids belittling them. You're never going to get what you want out of your spouse criticizing them. You're never going to get you know, what you want out of your boss dishonoring them. You have to show up with a different spirit if you want a different result. Otherwise, you're just further entrenching the dysfunction that's taking place. The reality is you will never get good results with a bad attitude. So clarity and, and coming in with kindness is the only way to see resolution. Now, here's the last one. Aim to win the person, not the issue. Okay, I hate to break this to you, but this is what a win looks like in most relationships out of conflict. I feel heard, I no longer carry hard feelings, and we move forward together. Okay, what I didn't say is you get your way. I didn't even say they change. Most conflict resolution, the win is this. I, you understand me better. So therefore, you're going to try. I no longer hold hard feelings at you, and you don't hold them at me. And we choose to move forward. If, you're, if, if, if a win for you is only you getting your way or people seeing it the way you are, you're just not going to have a lot of relationships because we're just too different. 
We see the world so differently. We, we go at things so differently. And if you expect everyone to bend to the way you see it, to how you want it, you're just not going to have a lot of people in your life. Most of conflict resolution is compromise. And that's, that's what it looks like. Now, um, l- l- let me just highlight this from the idea of you have to recognize, like, you have to take a step back. Because when you're in it, you, you can just feel so, I'm, I'm going to fight for this, I'm going to get my way. Listen, what would you rather have, an office at peace or to win the, the, every office argument but people hate you? I mean, would you rather have uh, every time you get your way at home or would you rather have a home in harmony? You know, it's just easier to resolve an issue than it is to dissolve a relationship. And, and the goal of this process is not to win the argument, it's to not lose the person. Jesus' ultimate goal is that we would walk away hand in hand. Why is that his goal? Well, I'll show you. You see, most of the time when we read the scriptures, what we realize is, or what we think is like Jesus is talking about one topic and then he just switches and goes off into another topic. But, uh, and that can, that can appear that way in Matthew 18. Because in Matthew 18, he's talking about conflict and then this is the next verse. I tell you the truth, whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven and whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. So it's like we've been listening to him on, on conflict resolution and then all of a sudden he just goes to, okay, let's talk about prayer. Prayer is so powerful, whatever you bind on earth, you can be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth can be loose in heaven. That's how prayer works. So we think, oh, okay, well, he's changed, he's changed subject. But that's actually not the case. Because notice verse 19. Also, I also tell you this, if two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I'm there among them. Let me be clear. He's not saying we're just in a room together. He's saying gather in unity, gather in harmony, gather in resolved conflict. This is Jesus raising the bar on conflict. He's saying, here's how you handle conflict. Now, let me tell you why you handle it that way. Because when you handle conflict and you resolve it, you release spiritual power in prayer. But if you choose to keep conflict, it undoes power of prayer. Because how can you be in agreement with somebody you're against? Jesus is pointing out and saying, hey, some of the things you're not seeing in your life that, that have come through the power of prayer are not in your life because you have unresolved issues with other people. Which Peter supports when he says, husbands, if you don't treat your wives the right way, your prayers are hindered. So let me ask you, what if the thing you've been asking God for hasn't arrived, not because he's not willing to give it, but because you're not willing to resolve the conflict? What, what if... Your business is suffering because of something going on in your marriage in conflict. What if your marriage is suffering because you're conflict with your boss? What if you don't have the influence you want with your kids because of the conflict you have with a neighbor? What we have to recognize is the way we handle conflict determines how much spiritual power we walk in. And that's what Jesus is saying. Now, and I, I know for, for many of you, you say, yeah, but it's too bad. This particular relationship is too, too far gone. This will work in some future things, but pastor, if I could tell you about all the things that have went on in this relationship, there's no hope. And I'm just saying to you that I have never seen a relationship so damaged that God can't heal it. Matter of fact, I was uh, years ago speaking at a conference, a freedom weekend like we have here, which by the way, let me just say freedom groups are essential if you want to grow as a believer today, it, it, you should sign up if you haven't been one in a freedom group. And here's why. Freedom's not just for people who are struggling with addictions. Freedom's for all of us because we all got hangups and old hurts and things we need God to free us from, old mindsets. And so freedom is a specific curriculum we offer in life groups so that you can go through and allow the Holy Spirit to do heart surgery and come out on the other side filled with the Spirit. It is life-changing. It is essential if you want God, all that God has for you, okay? So, so listen, I'm speaking at one of those in another church, and, um, and uh, I, I, I do the session on un- unresolved conflict, kind of on relational pain. And I invite people to come forward. Well, everybody comes forward because everybody's got this pain. And I noticed one particular guy. I mean, he's like six foot six, 300 pounds. And I just, but his face, you could just see the pain. And he comes up to receive prayer. And then all of a sudden I see this other guy come up to him and like just hug him. Now, I'm not talking about like, like, like guys hug each other. Like you doing all right, all right, cool, good. I mean like hug him. 
And they both start weeping, weeping. And I asked the host, I said, man, God's really doing something there. What, what's their story? He said, Joe, what you're looking at is a miracle. He said, that big guy is our county sheriff. And he said, the guy hugging him's name is Mike. He said, um, two years ago, Mike's brother got in a deal with armed robbery and ended up in a shootout with the sheriff's department. And he was killed. And it devastated Mike. And said, then the reports came out weeks later that the bullet that killed him was fired by the sheriff that he's hugging. He said, those two guys, we were concerned they could even be in a room together. And he said, but look how they're embracing one another. I'm just telling you what should have been sworn enemies, the power of the Holy Spirit caused two brothers to come back into unity. I've seen it with my own eyes. Your marriage is not so broken. Your, your family's not so, so just, just, just pulled apart. Your office is not that toxic. The Holy Spirit can fix any relationship. And I know, listen, I've sat with enough people on the couch. I've sat with enough people. They go, yeah, but, but, but what if I do the right thing? And, and, and they respond poorly. I got you a promise. Proverbs 16, 7. When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies be at peace with him. Do you know what that means? It means you do the right thing and leave the results to God. You do the right thing. You take the steps. It's not faith if everything, you can see how it all works out, but it's faith when, when you go, God, I, 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 I'm going to be the one that leads this restoration even though I'm hurt. And I'm going to go to them and I'm going to listen. Oh, and I'm going to bite my tongue, but I'm going to listen. And God, then when I talk, I, I'm going to be prepared and I'm going to be kind and I'm going to be clear and I'm not going to accuse them. And Lord, I'm here. I, I know we may not get through this whole thing and, and God, I might not get my way, but I'm here because peace pleases you. When you show up with that, the Lord does what only he can do. Now listen, here, here's just the truth. We're not very good at this as Christians. So I want to be very clear. The litmus for spiritual maturity is not how little conflict you have. It's how you handle the conflict you have. Amen. Jesus didn't call us peace finders. He called us peacemakers. And it's our responsibility, your responsibility, to take Jesus' words and allow him to counsel these relationships. And when you do, his divine grace comes in and does what you cannot do in the heart of other people. I want you to stand to your feet. And um, I'm going to pray over you. And then we're going to go into worship. And what I would do if I was you if, in worship today is that's when I would say, God, okay, I'm asking for your help. I would use worship as a time to start this process. Father, I pray today for every single person, marriages that are on the brink, and then marriages that just have gnawing little issues, mom and dads that are, that are at odds with brothers and sisters and vice versa, and, and bosses and employees and coworkers and teammates and classmates. God, every little place, whether it's big, small, large, toxic, or just beginning in dysfunction, may you give courage to the people that are here today to trust you with the results if they do the right thing. Lord, we've laid it out so clear, and I pray today that you would give them the courage to apply it and may peace and prosperity mark everything they do as they walk in obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.